find the cat and guess the cat. And a super, super surprise. Welcome to Juma this afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a really, really special Saturday afternoon here in South Africa. We're in the Greater Kruger National Park and only this morning I was talking about the possibility of a cheetah coming across quarantine and using it for a day or two uh, as a result of having a very special cheetah sighting this morning. Scott was so lucky he managed to get to a cheetah sighting over on Arethusa and it had killed a dake. I believe there was an interaction between the cheetah and a, and a leopard and a daker and well, it was one of those really strange African mornings. We were lucky enough to watch him feeding on the daker and then towards the end of drive Scott stayed along excuse me Scott, Scott stayed a little bit longer uh, and followed the cheetah off of Arethusa onto a, a property south of us and I think everybody thought that was going to be the last we saw of him until they turned up somewhere else maybe in Torchwood or Biffleshook as it usually occurs but well we're very very lucky because this cat has chosen quarantine to come and hide in the shade although the shade hasn't been much needed it's more hiding in cover because if anything comes out onto the open area today they're certainly not going to be expecting a cheetah coming out of a bush. My name is Mark, Viem is on camera with me this afternoon and Nikki's in final control. Scott and Viem are busy with something else at the moment, they're going to be coming live to us shortly uh, when I'm going to give them a chance but I think we can't really do anything but watch this cheetah for the time being. Now I'm sitting quite far away when I got here there was a vehicle that was virtually on top of him. He was very tense and very nervous and I've asked that vehicle to move away a little bit and we have moved away a little bit and now he's actually relaxed so much we can barely see him because he was so tense he was sitting up and I know that it's very difficult to see him but I don't want to stress this cheetah out too much and force him to run away because he's found himself a little bit of a haven here on quarantine and if the vehicles behave properly and they don't treat him like a lion or a leopard because the lion and the leopard are completely different individuals or characters when it comes to sitting with them and letting them close to the vehicles or even being close to them with the vehicles cheetah are different cheetah are very very nervous cats because they are probably the weakest of the big cats they have so many enemies I've even seen jackal and vultures chase cheetah off of a kill and because cheetah rely on speed so much because it is so crucial to their existence and their survival that any injury to a cheetah could result in uh, that injury hampering their hunting abilities so they are constantly on guard and it's only when they really really relax can they lie down the way he's lying down now uh, he probably won't go to sleep until much much later where he can find himself a very safe haven but he's on his shoulder his head is up and that's that's sort of quite normal for a cheetah sitting up on his elbows as it were that is a cheetah that is a little bit more tense it's a little it's a cheetah that is is more vigilant and while it'd be nice to see him doing so and he might if something occurs there was a water buck that was running away but if he sits up it's because he's seen something. So once again, we're with a cat and we want to exercise a little bit of patience, caution and patience with him. We don't want to press him. He deserves a little bit of a nap without trouble. Lynn, hello Lynn. In Toronto and Canada. 
Ben wants to know if cheetah pair for life. Yeah, he's actually become quite remarkably relaxed. He's even to the point that I can maybe move a little bit so that we've got a clearer view of his face. still overcast in fact it, it got a little bit sunny earlier and there was a break in the cloud but the clouds starting to come back and a pretty strong wind is coming in it can help him it can hinder him but he's got one thing going for himself and that is that he's managed to sneak onto quarantine at a time when nobody else is around so no one knows that he's here that's good for hunting that's good for not being detected was a monkey I believe shouting at him earlier but not not like it would shout at a, a leopard and as long as we don't draw attention to him. Anyways the question was um, do cheetah mate for life and does the male play any part in the upbringing? Very interesting question because straight enough cheetah are the kind of cat that require a lot of adult supervision, in fact, they were rather direction. Cheetah don't have as much instinct and as much um, natural inborn desire to chase or to kill as the other cats. That's the wrong way of putting it, really. It's got a lot to do with the habitat the way they hunt and the ability to teach their children because of that that makes them different to say things like leopard and lion. Leopard live in very thick bush generally, they're hunting in thick terrain, they've got to stalk their prey and get really really close to their prey before they can pounce. So it's not really good for a leopard to have her cub anywhere nearby when she's, when she's hunting because of the way that they hunt. For cheetahs, completely the opposite. Cheetah are hunting in open areas and everything is visible and it's because of that that it's not something that can be instinctive. It's something that she has to show her cubs how to do and very often you might find if this was a female with cubs, she would probably, if she was going to hunt, get up from there, leave the cubs hidden under that bush and hunt out on the open area so that they could see her. And then from that point on, there is a process of teaching that she needs to introduce to them that can be quite harsh to watch but it's a process of learning how to learning how to catch learning how to kill learning how to feed and learning how to do it quickly as well as getting away from predators and and, and not being a part of of predators lives that can endanger their lives very very often cheetah will just abandon their kill with the slightest hint of danger now he's sitting up, but he's sitting up because he's cleaning and he's relaxed enough that he's gone to cleaning. And for me, that's great news. So I'm going to just get a better view of him now that he's sitting up. I'm also pleased that he's accepting our presence too. Because now we can see a cheetah being a cheetah rather than on guard too often. Good afternoon, Mario. Wonderful to hear from you. Mario is asking if this cheat is alone or 
if there are others around. Kind of ties in with the last question I was answering um, in the sort of composition of cheetah. Males don't really have much to play, part to play in the family. And in all of my cheetah observations in the past, I've never really seen males interacting with females and cubs the way I've seen leopard interacting with females and cubs, although I do know that it happens. And it just shows that being a behavioral trait of an animal, you, you can't attribute the behavior of one animal to all animals of that species. So it becomes very crucial to to take what you're observing as a really unique and wonderful experience because how one cheetah behaves not, not necessarily mean that another will behave the same way but generally speaking males are out on their own and Margo you often do find that male siblings join up and form coalitions and as coalitions they, they un, until they separate uh, when they sub adults they manage to hunt together and I've known of uh, brothers who've been able to bring down bigger prey because they've been able to hunt cooperatively in ways that I suppose wasn't really thought of with cheetah or it's not the way it does happen with leopard. But he's definitely traveling alone at the moment. I don't know his history. Just like the, the, the leopard and the lion we could take screenshots and I should even have my camera out. I don't know why I haven't. I think I haven't because I've been concentrating on his facial movements. I've been concentrating on his his uh, posture, his ears, all of his behavior to make sure that we're not going to impose too much on him. And since we've gotten here, I think he's relaxed considerably. He's cleaning, he's licking his lips, his ears are up. He's a happy cat now. And maybe now I can try and get a photo but we could probably take spot patterns from him and get Nadi and look at photos from the past or look at photos from guides all over the Sabi sand and we'd probably be able to identify him as a particular male that we could track throughout the Sabi sand based on other other lodges and, and guides seeing him over time. He's not so uh, moved by Vietnam. Dave in the UK. Sorry, I just had to listen to the question there. Once again, he's relaxed and that's good. Um, I wonder if this is Benoni Dave. How far has he moved since the kill and would he return to it? He's moved uh, quite a distance, Dave. He's, uh, the, the kill was just off of Arethusa airstrip somewhere from what I understand. and. In the straight line that he would have moved in, from what I can, from what I can gather from Scott's description of where he went after Scott left him, and where he has come through now, he's he's travelled in quite a large arc from Arethusa airstrip, and I would say all in all, it's probably a distance of a mile and a half, maybe, maybe two miles at the most. Uh, Maybe not even that far, a mile. I'm just looking at it. I could probably calculate it if I looked at a map later on and try and get a better idea, but he won't go back to the kill. A cheetah doesn't go back to a kill, and that's mainly because scavengers will find it. And the longer a kill lasts on the ground, the longer, or the greater the chances of there being battalions who are going to bring vultures, who are going to bring jackal or hyena or lion or leopard. And a cheetah doesn't need a confrontation. As I said earlier, they're so particular about their health. They, they like the sprinter. They like the Olympic sprinter rather than the marathon runner. A marathon runner can can suffer a few injuries and recover from it and still run a marathon. But a sprinter like the cheetah, an injury if a sprint if, if a sprinter had to run for their meal every evening or every day, 
just a slight bruise can change the time and that little fraction of a second can determine the difference between life and death. Hello James, I've been meaning to talk to you James, nice to hear from you and James is asking what is its ability to maintain its speed, not very far, further than any of the other cats I have to say, uh, you look at the, the the cat with the shortest distance of running is the leopard because it's mostly it's mostly a pouncing cat, it's mostly a stalking and pouncing cat and well lion are a little bit of a runner because lion they're just these big bulky things and they've they've got to stalk but they they've got to start to hunt a lot further away than a leopard because of their type of prey but they've also got to use strategy and lion don't have a very um, high level or high tolerance for for cardiac exercise. So lion often have to give up pretty quickly. Uh, lion maybe can sustain or rather maintain speed for a couple of hundred yards. Cheetah on the other hand, because they are runners, that is their entire hunting game and speed is of the essence. They've got to accelerate so fast in a short amount of time to be able to catch up with their prey because you see the, 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 the catch to two of it is that they're hunting out in the open so that when they start their run they've got to be confident enough that the gap between themselves and their prey is sufficient that they can overcome that distance with the acceleration that they have and then maintain that and I suppose of about 400, 500 yards maximum. Don't know, I'm not one for numbers, but if I had to assign numbers, that would be probably about it. Leopard don't run for more than a few yards, lion for maybe a few, couple of hundred, but cheetah maybe for a few more. And then we start looking at the animals that have a running gait and a, 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 a hunting strategy because they're communal, that it's a conservative gait, so they're conserving energy and they, they trot more than anything else. The hyena, the wild dog, they can last like that for kilometers or miles, whichever way you want to put it. Because they also run in relays. Interesting question, James. James is asking. How long to recover? And I don't know the answer to that one, James. How long to recover, whether it's a successful or unsuccessful hunt, from that burst of speed? You can imagine there's an adrenaline rush that's happening as well. So there's a heart rate increase there. I can't imagine actually what must go through a cheetah's body at that moment of, of burst of energy hitting speeds that no other animal can, can reach. It must be incredible. But the, the, the time period between rest periods or the time to recover from that? I don't know. I noticed that actually it's not very long. I mean, it's not very long from a point of view of. I just had a burst of wind, a very strong wind that made him sit up, unless it was me talking. I am a little bit downwind from him, so I'm hoping we're not impact. But now he's sitting up, I want him to go back a bit. I'm trying to get you the best pictures. Now, also. 
to interrupt myself. This is... I want to dedicate this to Nancy. I'm not going to find you a flower, but I found you a, te a cheetah, Nancy. Nancy is a viewer who was with us for many, many years, going back a long way. She and Tara had a very close relationship. Um, if I remember correctly, with Tara and her Tigger socks. Nancy was known as Beekalips and she was part of the community that helped us get where we are today. One of the viewers that stayed with us through thick and thin and as some of the viewers say it, she went over the rainbow bridge last night and so Nancy, there's no flower, there's a cheetah. Maybe Nancy sent us the cheetah. Oh, gee, something gave it a fright. I think something nipped its tail or something there. <laughs> it was shame something gave it a try fright. Nancy I mean Kathy, sorry, Tennessee, I think. Um the stripes on his face are are they unique to the cheetah? Some yes and some no. Uh, the, the, the the dark markings, those beautiful dark tear lines which are uh, characteristic or rather they're diagnostic they are the, they are the the, the, the the markings that define a cheetah really those beautiful black tear lines um, whilst it has been said that they're there to absorb light and cut out the glare when they're hunting during the day it, yeah right like the mascara it's all about facial expressions and and cheetah body language that they need to communicate to each other at times and you'll notice how those tear lines going to the corners of her eyes and the corners of her mouth they will enhance they will emphasize they will from a distance be able to give another cheetah an indication of what her facial expression is like based on her mood and whether they can approach or not um, it's all about cheetah language. It's like all the markings on all the animals. There are there are hidden messages in all of those markings that only those animals know about. That we are only just beginning to learn. Because it's all got to do with not only the facial expressions, but the level of the head, whether the head is up or down, and the angle of those lines. But if we look at the lines coming down from his eyes, going down be behind his eyes cheetah facial markings are as unique as any leopard or lions and while all cheetah do have those black tear lines coming down from the eye they do vary slightly and if we were able to we could get a little bit closer on him we'd maybe be able to see finer detail winds picking up considerably and might even improve his chances of hunting at some point. Yes, he will. He could. I think the. I, I don't know how much of that steenbuck he had this morning. Was it a steenbuck? Yeah. It was a daker. Oh, it was a daker. Of course, me. I don't know the difference. I called a, an odd a steenbuck the other day. So who, who am I to tell what it was? I'm just going to take a couple of photos, even if he's got his eyes closed. I'm glad he's got his eyes closed, because he's... We can even maybe go into this beautiful big terminalia. Change our angle a little bit.
Valerie in Pennsylvania. Hello, Valerie. Valerie's asking if they are opportunistic hunters. Even if they fall, would they go for something if they see it? Valerie, I think every predator on Earth has to be opportunistic to some degree. And yes, cheetah are, um, I think, being very, very full. And from my observations of cheetah, that quite often they might give up on the opportunity because they're just simply too heavy to do so. I've seen cheetah after a kill lying under a tree and just letting the impala walk by. But it is also an individual thing. You, you, you never know. You could have a cheetah that's full that sees an opportunity and will go for it. Um, Dara, or should I say, is it Dara? It's like branches and branches and grasses and grasses. Dara or Dara is in Ohio. Oh, now I've forgotten the question. Sorry, I'm concentrating on what he was doing. Oh, at what age? Are able to run at full speed. Well, I suppose running at full speed means the age that they're able to hunt and catch something. Uh, see, cheetah essentially don't ever get to, I don't think they ever really get to full speed. They're never running in a straight line, so. As long as they're able to catch their prey, they might not even be at full speed. And during the, the learning process, during cheetah cubs learning process, the, 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 the stages that it takes for them to learn how to hunt, uh, there's, a, there's one stage in the process where they are given, their mother gives them a, a, a young animal, be it a baby impala or a, a scrub hare or a young gazelle or something young. And it's from that moment that they learn how to chase something. So they become proficient at hunting before they're actually running at full speed. And I would imagine that the answer would lie in when they supposedly, I suppose, fully adult from about two, two and a half years old. Uh, when they're fully adult is when they then, their, their limbs are as long as they're going to get, but muscle mass has to build up and much like we've seen with the leopards uh, hold on a second the mark has can cancel the lapanchi i'm getting a little bit of sunshine coming in now which is nice Absolutely beautiful markings.
Hi Chrissy, North Carolina. Wanting to know if the population here is perhaps endangered. I'm going to, rather than have vehicle behind us, I'm going to just move again. Population of cheetah in South Africa is pretty stable um, in, in within national parks, and there are a lot of places that are reintroducing them or have six or well, where their populations are re-establishing themselves. I am um, a little bit back. I think in areas where they are protected, their populations are pretty good, but it's, it's almost unwinnable battle in that the genetics are not so great. So throughout Africa, there isn't a very good gene pool. And there he's lying down again. Question from London, from Corin in London. Hello, Corin. Is it true that they're not part of the cat family? No, that's not true, Corin. At all. They are cats, but they are not part of the lion and leopard branch of the cat family. They are their own branch of the cat family. They are most certainly cats. In fact, they're only big cats that purr. But I think the misconception comes about because when you look at scientifically or, or in, in nomenclature and how lion, leopard, jaguars and tiger, how they are linked genetically, um, cheetah are kind of on a, on a completely different branch of the, of the evolutionary tree, for want of a better phrase. Uh, I think, if anything, cheetah are probably on a branch a lot closer to the puma, the mountain lion, in, in the sense that the mountain lion is also this branch of the cat tree that is not from the genus Panthera. Not to say that the puma or the mountain lion is the same as the cheetah, but the two of them are cats, but they're just not part of that branch of the cat family. There's some birds making a lot of noise further up. Nothing to do with the cheetah, I don't think. But it is making them a bit nervous. Rochelle wants to know if I've ever seen him before. I would probably have to compare photographs from cheetah that I've seen um, from years ago, Rochelle. Uh, there were two boys that we used to see uh, on cheetah cut line going up into Biffleshook. We found them a few times up on the corner of Biffleshook cut line. Um, also along cheetah cut line. Could be he's one of them that's now a little bit older. But I haven't been in the Sabi Sands for a number of years, since, the, since November of 2011. 
and if he's younger than that, obviously I don't know him, but he's also the first che cheater I've seen since being back here, and I got back here in early December of last year. It's the first cheater. Scott was lucky enough to have him on drive this morning, and he's the first cheater we've had on camera uh, since we began our latest series of broadcasts from Juma. And at this stage, I don't know if I've seen him before. If he's old enough to have been one of the boys that were walking around here four years ago, maybe. Now we're getting a little bit of a break in the cloud in the west and we're going to have the most incredible light on him. Tess wants to know, and Tess is from Ohio, Tess wants to know, do all of the cats have equal vision and which of them can see further? I wouldn't even know how to measure that, Tess, but I'd probably be able to think about it. And I, I think Cheetah, being an open plains hunter, needing the kind of vision that they do, needing long far-sightedness, I suppose. I suppose they would probably have better clarity at distance than a leopard would need. I'm not saying that leopard are short-sighted cats, I'm just saying that leopard, when they're hunting, everything's close quarters and they, and, and how do we know what they can see at distance? Because they don't really ever react to things at distance much. So I would hazard a guess and say Cheetah have probably got better long vision, distance vision. The elephants at Gary Dam, I think we have to go to the, hang on, sorry. Sorry, folks, I've got to talk on the radio. Uh, Mark, you go. Uh, you don't need to stand by. You're welcome to join me. Sorry, Nikki, go again, please. Raisa is asking if Cheetah only hunt at night, or rather in daytime, or do they hunt at night? Hi Raisa, from Finland. Personally, I've observed Cheetah being interested in things at night. I, I, I've been very, very lucky in the years that I've been out in the bush, and my passion and obsession with the full moon to be out in the full moon. I was very, very lucky in the early days in the Sabi sand to go out in full moons when there was, well, after everybody was in bed and spend a lot of time out with cats on open areas. And I was very lucky to spend time with cheetah on open areas. And occasionally I could, I saw how they would get interested in impala and things, uh, sitting up and watching them in the distance. But I don't think high speed, no matter how great their vision may be on a full moon, I don't think high speed in this kind of environment is a good idea without maybe some LEDs or halogens behind you. So I think it depends. I have to invoke the depends rule here. I think maybe in the Kalahari and in other parts of, maybe in Namibia and other parts of Africa, maybe the Serengeti where it's grassland and open maybe in the full moon or maybe cheetah do hunt at night i wouldn't i would never say that they're exclusively diurnal it's like i always thought that wild dog were diurnal and i thought that wild dog wouldn't really hunt much at night at all 
until we had that camera on the wild dog den and the day that we went live with the camera was the day that the pups came out of the den and for three months we had 24 hours of wild dog coming and going from the wild dog den and they came back several times during night um, after killing to bring food back for the pup, pups so I wouldn't put it past cheetah to hunt at night um, if the conditions were right if the chance of, was there but generally speaking night time they find a place it's night time is when lion hyena and leopard are, are a lot more active and all three of those predators are more than capable of killing cheetah in fact cheetah are cheetah are very very shy they're shy of everything um, I don't know if you heard me earlier but I said I've seen cheetah being chased by chased off of their kills by jackal and, and vultures alone so they choose to be kind of secretive they choose to to not uh, have confrontations with other predators and generally much like we saw with quarantine and that nyala kill with the hyena the other night rather relinquish your meal and hunt again with a, with, with, with a sound body than try and defend it and get an injury when you can't hunt again and that self-preservation is a very important instinct Jim, could you, could you zoom out for me, just to show, show sort of a, a broader... Because Brenda in Pennsylvania is asking, where, if, since they don't climb trees, where would they bed down for the night? Well, this is what we're looking at, Brenda. Um, can you see the cheetah? It's kind of bush, it's bushes like this, um, where they bed down mostly during the day and you'll notice that it's completely the opposite at night. If it were night time now, um, from that vantage point where he is now, he's probably got a pretty much a 360 degree view through every little gap in every little leaf. Uh, um, around this open area, he's got an incredible view of anything moving. So if there was anything in his peripheral view, he would, he would be aware of it. And come nightfall, he'll probably come out from that cover uh, keeping in mind that that cover is there but he'd come out into the open where he can see and he'll probably fly on a termite mound or out on a flat area where he still has that same command of the entire open area and from what he's seen during the day going into nightfall he will know how safe it is and he'll know that no matter where he is he'll be able to see something coming from a distance um, they are able to jump into trees, uh, especially young cheetah do, do a bit of climbing. Uh, they can leap, and I've often seen cheetah getting into trees away from hyena. But they need trees that have been pushed over by elephant trees that are at, a, at an angle, trees that have uh, that are either 45 degrees or 30 degrees. They're able to. In fact, they use them a lot for vantage points. There are a few of them around if danger happened to come, but they're best their best form of defense is just running away and having enough time to do so. Unfortunately, lying in the shade like that, uh, there could be other cats that are doing the same thing. And lion, much like a cheetah, would be under the covers looking around, seeing the whole world. And fortunately, I've never seen it in real life, but I've seen film of lion approaching sleeping cheetah in shade like that and the cheetah were completely unawares and of course they lost their lives. Um, remarkable footage that was sent to me, pictures by Penny in Durban of a cheetah that had killed an impala, a big male cheetah like this that had killed an impala and he was probably so intent on the kill and, and, and throttling it he didn't see the leopard coming up and the leopard killed him and took both the cheetah carcass and the impala carcass into a tree so they, they're quite vulnerable, but they are also, the longer they live, the more 
vigilant they become, the more aware they are of their environment. They learn through the mishaps of bumping into other predators, being chased by hyena, or being dogged by hyena. Hyena that just sit around waiting for them to make the move and then as soon as they kill the hyena know that they are able to steal the prey. I watched a remarkable incident in Tanzania a few years ago with Cheetah and her three young cubs and she made a play for some impala and she actually caught one and she was throttling it and it had sadly it, I think it had broken a leg and as she was throttling it the local troop of baboons and these are olive baboons different, a little different to our chakma baboons sorry, no, not olive, they're yellow baboons olive baboons are up in the Serengeti getting mixed up, yellow baboons but this troop of baboons a uh, big male and several youngsters, not the whole troop, but several of them mobbed the cheetah that she ran away um, the cubs, fortunately the cubs got out of there very very fast, although they were chased by other baboons and it was getting very very close at one point, I was feared for the lives of those cubs but she stood her ground for a while with the big male baboon and eventually she turned tail and ran and it was quite weird how the, this impala was still alive, was still breathing and the uh, the baboons are poking it and prodding it and eventually the impala got up the baboon will be became bored and the cheetah came back and killed the impala but the baboon came back and chased her off again and it was really very very strange circumstances Hi Trent. No, I haven't had the fortune with the big the I uh, haven't had the pleasure of having a cheetah jump onto my car. I've seen how it's how it's occurred up in, in East Africa. I did spend some time in the Masai Mara in Kenya. And funnily enough I did see cheetah. Um I was I was in a cheetah sighting with the BBC Big Cat Diary vehicle with Jonathan Scott in a cheetah sighting and the cheetah was using his, the shade of his vehicle rather than sitting on his vehicle and it was more important for the cheetah at the time to see shade than seek shade rather than seek prey so the cheetah itself was um, and her cubs actually she had very very young cubs was sleeping in the shade of his Land Rover. is asking a question about some photos that were posted uh, of a leopard chasing a cheetah on an airstrip. That wasn't on Nkoro, it might have been posted by Nkoro, but that actually happened on Arethusa's airstrip this morning. It was the same cheetah, Jeannie. Uh, from what I understand, he was on Arethusa airstrip and uh, a leopard... I'll, fi I'll find out now from Ryan. Uh, I think it was Kwatile. Ryan, who was that ingwe on your airstrip? Kwatile. So it was Kwatile that chased him, and I think it was in chasing him that he then 
ended up killing the Steenbuck. So that happened on Arethusa airstrip, uh, but the Nkoro guards were probably there, so they probably posted it. asking about a territory where the cheetah have territories uh, they ch cheetah more have more of a home range now there's a subtle difference I guess between a home range and a territory when we're talking about uh, animals and cheetah don't necessarily have a territory they, they're constantly on the move they have very large areas that they roam in but they are they become familiar with particular habitat types and terrain types that become favorable for hunting um, and rather than going to unknown ground they will they will they will move around um, within that home range that is familiar area to them and it's more than likely an area that their mother has taken them in and taught them in uh, being very much learned hunters the way they are taught how to hunt they kind of take on the characteristics that their mother taught them or that their mother had grown up with so you find cheetah that specialize in certain animals or that have found ways to hunt certain animals will teach their children how to do that and that sort of behavior then becomes perpetuated within that that within successive generations of those cheetah um, so that they, they do stick to certain areas, but it's a very, very large areas that they, they, they cover, I suppose, in much the same way as wild dog. In fact, very similar to wild dog. Wild dog don't really have territories, but they do have ranges that they move in, and they don't really move out of those ranges. It's familiar territory, or wrong word to use, it's familiar habitat, it's familiar ground to them, and it's large enough that they can that that home range that they cover is large enough that they can be in a different area every day because their presence becomes too easily noticed by either competitors like lion and leopard and hyena and jackal and birds to some degree um, but also because their presence gets noted by the prey species so they've got to be in new areas for that surprise element to be able to have successful hunts in a new area almost every day. It's one of the reasons why when there is a cheetah here we have to capitalize on having its presence uh, or rather of, of, of being able to look at it and enjoy its presence. And as the evening wears on I've got no doubt that there are going to be some animals coming out onto the open area. It'll be interesting to see if anything's going to develop but so far we want to just Tight and maybe we'll go and see what Scott's doing. afternoon and who would have thought that the cheetah would have come right onto our doorstep here at Juma on the quarantine clearings and so happy we've got off to a great start and look forward to hearing what unfolds this afternoon with that cheetah so what a great start and so happy that Mark has also got to see the cheetah as it certainly is a rare animal for us to see so really happy that he's got a chance to spend some time with it. Myself and Jason have been enjoying being back, working together. It's been a long time since we were out here exploring and adventuring together. So we've been having a really great time catching up. And we've been looking for Mvula. We haven't had any luck. We did respond to some alarm calls just a few minutes ago. And we found a hyena, which was still exciting and still 
good to find, but she moved off and it looks like the mother of some of the cubs that live here at the den site where we spend a lot of time and she did head in this general direction after we found her. So I think we're going to pop into the den site quickly and see if it's active. Thereafter we will decide what to do and possibly continue our search for Mvula. It's a wonderful cool afternoon and we're really enjoying the cloudy weather and hope that it brings some more rain as we only had a tiny spattering of rain last night. Some really interesting information about the cheetah from this morning is that when it was found it was initially on the Arethusa airstrip and it was not there alone it was also there with a female leopard now I'm not sure if Mark has mentioned this but I will reiterate because it really is interesting and the female leopard chased the cheetah and he ran off into the bushes and literally while he was running away from this female leopard he obviously came across this diker and managed to kill it and that probably added to his nervousness while he was feeding on the kill this morning because he knew there was a leopard very nearby and I'm sure that he when he caught the diker it would have let off a loud bleat and that loud bleat would not only attract the leopard but also any other predators and it's not all antelope that will let off a loud bleating noise in distress when they are caught it's mainly diker that do that and warthog are another animal I've copied all of that, thank you, just let me know when you're ready I've just got a message from Nikki that there have been a lot of questions wanting to know if Romeo, who's also known as Jason, is back and he certainly is. He's right behind me on camera and so wonderful to have him back with us. The timing worked out very well and he's on his university holidays now and him coming back has allowed Brian to head off and leave, so perfect timing. Anyway, it sounds like there's some action over with Mark, so we'll cut across to him and catch up with you a little bit later. Well, he's decided to to move just out of the blue he got up and he's looking about so The only thing, Cheetah doesn't seem to be used to vehicles is he lost. He's not lost and he is actually ignoring the vehicles. He is 
quite fine with the vehicle, as long as we keep our distance. He's not looking at us. He's doing what cheetah do, Sandy. He is, he's behaving exactly as I would expect a cheetah to be behaving. He's making sure that everywhere, 360 degrees around him, there's neither prey, predator nor prey. Um, one he might want, one he doesn't want. But the fact is that he's got to be alert all the time. That is what makes a cheetah a successful animal. I'm sitting here, he's coming towards us. If he was not used to the vehicles, he wouldn't be walking towards me. Um, we've also been spending enough time with him over the last few minutes. Ah, well, oops, he stood on a thorn. See, even cheetah can walk, step on thorns. I don't know what that was. It's probably... It's probably a devil's thorn or something. Very, very sleek little boy. Hello, gorgeous. Right in front of us now. So he's totally relaxed with the vehicles. His nervousness is not about us. If you can notice now, he's totally ignoring us. But he is moving down towards the lodge. can run outside, you'd see us from, oh, maybe not now. So I'm guessing that he's going to head up Wuitela Access Road, maybe. Make a kill to remain healthy. You can hear squirrels shouting at him now. And as the squirrel started shouting, his ears went flat. He put his head down as if to say, Oops, I've been spotted. Laura, probably every few days. Uh, it's, uh, they probably couldn't go longer than a week or so. Now it's getting dark and he's probably going to find a nice little spot to lie out in the open right now. He might even go and jump up on the sign later. But I think he wants to lie down. Looks like he wanted to lie down there for a minute. This is what I was saying, is that now that, it, now that he's, he's spent time undercover for so long, sorry, I guess it's not too easy to put you down, but so the time of day has come that he's now going to spend the rest of it in the open. He's, I guess he's happy enough that there are going to be no predators coming. And he's, he's far enough away from the edges of the open area that if anything were to appear, if there was anything near him, that he would be able to dash off. His speed will get him away from it quick enough. Super, super that he's, he's in such a relaxed state. Hello Genevieve. Uh, 
Shanti, Genevieve in New York. An interesting question. Genevieve is asking. Is anything coming? Any people are looking at that way for something. Gula might be around. He might even hear some alarm calls and come investigate. Genevieve is asking, with a huge lung capacity, is the diaphragm affected by a full stomach? Because Genevieve is noticing that after the kill that he's had this morning, he's not really panting like the other cats do. Uh... I think it's got a lot to do with temperature too right now, Genevieve. I think at the moment it's it's pretty cool, uh, temperature-wise. It's pretty cool that we were the cheetah, sort of hip-hop-wise, but temperature-wise, he doesn't. he's not overheating at the moment. He hasn't been running. He's been resting probably for a considerable part of the day, and... I don't think he might, I don't think he could have eaten very much of that that steenbuck. Uh, he's looking pretty lean. I think a lot. He's maybe even processed some of what he ate earlier. And I, but I've seen I've seen cheetah panting, much like leopard and lion do, with the full tummy on a hot day. And wait till you see a cheetah after it's actually exerted itself in a hunt. Where he's lying now is actually a spot where the, the local herd of Impala spend most of their evenings. Almost every evening that local group of Impala are out here and it's going to be very interesting to see what happens uh, as the evening wears on. Very good question from Lisa. Lisa wants to know if his scent marked anyway or is incognito all the time. Uh, so far, well, I don't know. Um, Lisa, I have no idea. Um, what you have seen of him this afternoon is the same as what I've seen of him. I'd have to ask Scott if he did this morning because uh, Scott might have seen him moving this morning. I personally, since, he's, since he, he got up from the shade where he was earlier to lie down here, um, I haven't seen him, so I can't answer that. So Scott is saying that he was actually quite moving quite fast this morning, or in Scotty's words, highly mobile, which is radio parlance for he was moving quite fast. And so if Scott didn't see him sent marking this morning great having this communication that we do have because I get the message in my ear as soon as I've asked the question um, so not yet, it would be interesting to see if he does so at the moment we can assume he's sort of incognito squirrels are shouting at him hang on Copy it, enjoy. Sherry in Ohio wants to know the lifespan of a cheetah. How old do I think he is? Hmm, gosh, numbers again. Uh, I don't know, Sherry. I have no idea how old he is. But I'm going to look closer with my binoculars. If he yawns, I'll get a bit of a look at his teeth. If... If I didn't... Uh, He's adult. He's he's not a fully grown. I'd say he's a he's a young adult. Just looking at it. his neck isn't as thick and as robust as a not a very big male. Go ahead, Scott. Come and join me.
Uh, sorry, Nicky, I was on the other radio, I didn't hear that. Question from birthday girl Brenda. Hello Brenda. Nice birthday gift for you. Is it true that he uses his tail as a rudder to steer when he's running at high speed? To some degree, yes, steering in balance at high speed. Now, if any of you have ever, maybe as a kid, I don't know, I still do it as an adult sometimes, when you put your hand out of the car window and you're driving at like 30, 40, 50 miles an hour, and you just move your palm up and down a little bit and you see how the wind catches it well if you can imagine a cheetah that's running at maybe 60 miles an hour 50 60 miles an hour um, the, 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 the shape of its tail when it moves its tail from side to side you can imagine that the, the, the wind resistance and the, the way the tail is shaped Yes, to a large extent it does. It helps to steer the cheetah. But also, most importantly, it's also a balancing thing. It's a counterbalance because no animal really runs in a straight line. When everything's are running away from a cheetah, some of their best defense is changing direction quickly. And so the cheetah has to change direction. In any movie you've ever seen in, on, on National Geographic, perhaps, uh, you might find that at high speed, it's it, you'll see how many times a cheetah is changing direction. So yes, the tail does help with that, but also in terms of throwing its body. Look at him; he's quite comfortable now. You know, a cat's comfortable when it's rolling on its back. Um, but sometimes you see how, when in in, in mid stream, when it uh, or, or mid sprint, when a cheetah is changing direction sometimes throws the tail from side to side more as a, a, a counterbalance than as a rudder. So it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of many things. Vicky is saying that the cheetah's head is so much smaller than the body and is this why they're the fastest land mammals? Not so much the head, no, well, the head plays a big part in that Vicky, most certainly. Uh, having the much smaller head is not carrying the weight of the jaws of a leopard or rather the jaws and the, 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 the heavy skull of a leopard or a lion. It's got a much smaller skull. Um, but it's only part of it. The other part of a cheetah's physiology that lends itself to high speed is a very very narrowed body you can see it with him lying down he's only a few inches thick or oh, I mean that's what that's maybe eight to ten inches at widest at his most widest point if, if that at the hips and his shoulders um, so it's a very very flattened what we call dorsal ventrally flattened body is it dorsal ventrally or whatever it's a flattened body very long legs not very m when you look at leopard's legs you can see the power in their forearms like their biceps and their and their forearms um, their thighs the cheetah have very stubby legs they've got very thick paws in relationship to the size of the body cheetah on the other hand it's all very very thin it's all very very sleek it's it's like that the, the, the quintessential runner's body versus sort of the muscle man, the weightlifter, like the leopard. Please watch camera on me.
after you go again with that again, Nikki. Hi, Enid. And Enid is asking, are Tita unable to climb trees because they don't have fully retractable claws? Uh, no, actually it's got nothing to do with the claws at all, Enid. Um, but yes, you are right, it's more got to do with the physiology, more got to do with the body type. Tita don't have retractable claws, but they do have protractile claws. Their claws are fixed. Their claws are fixed because the claws help them give grip when they're running and changing direction at speed it's why the tail being the rudder type balancing act is not the only thing but also because um, those claws that are permanently fixed give them grip like a runner's spikes do on their shoes and um, and yet they do they are able to protract their claws they're able to extend their claws which they do when they're actually making for the kilt they're able to to pull their claws out to be able to try and hook, especially the dew claw I think, to hook that animal in mid-flight and be able to flip it on its back and sometimes even a cheetah is so successful at that that they uh, that the animal either it breaks its neck or it, or it suffers a severe injury at high speed. But it's more a case of they don't have the forearm strength, they don't have the arm strength. They've given up power for speed and for speed they've been given these very long, very lithe legs that just don't have the power that, that give them the ability to climb trees. Claws do have a role in that, in that, in that being permanently out the way that they are they are constantly worn fairly fairly blunt so cheetah's claws are not necessarily as sharp as a leopard's claws that are able to grip but a cheetah and a leopard could probably extend their claws in a very similar way it's just that the cheetah can't pull their claws back in the way leopard and lion and other cats are able to I'm wondering Scotty's joining me now I'm wondering if uh, wondering if Scotty wants to maybe film him from the other angle. Welcome on board the Jigger and who would have thought we would have been lucky enough to have both of us here enjoying this incredible sighting together and not only that it's great that Jason gets to be involved in his first cheetah broadcast with Wild Earth he was also here in November December and January when we didn't see one cheetah so he's very happy with that And I'm also so happy, I really didn't expect him to travel this far and that's the great thing about being here, you always get surprised by the animals and their movements. Justin's noticed, well we've just got a question through from Justin, good afternoon Justin, and Justin has noticed that the cheetah is very alert and he wonders if they get any stress complications from always being alert, but no they don't and think of all the other animals, the impala and all of those animals that are also always on high alert, and even the other predators, even lion will be alert and leopard will be alert because other lion and other leopard can even be threats to their own species so I do agree though he is on edge and I think that's got a lot to do with the wind that we're experiencing and a lot of the animals will become more nervous in the wind because the noise of any animals approaching them would be muffled by the rustling of the wind blowing through the dry vegetation so the wind definitely does 
increase the alertness of all species of animals out here. Also the fact that he's kind of on unknown territory as far as we know. We're not sure if he's ever been here before. And just like us humans, when we're in an unfamiliar place, we would also be a little bit more alert than normal. He could of course have passed through these clearings without us even knowing, but I think it's fairly fair to assume that he hasn't been here recently and that may also contribute to his alertness. We've just got another question through from Grace. Good afternoon, Grace, and welcome on board. Grace is interested to know how much sleep cheetah get daily, and I'm sure it's similar to that of lion and leopard, between 18 and 20 hours a day sleep. They will spend a lot of day resting, a lot of the day resting, and even the night. So, no different to a lot of the cats that we have out here, and even domestic cats. They do spend a lot of time sleeping. Well, will the yawn we've just seen be an indicator that he's going to get up and move? It's not guaranteed. And those of you who were with us yesterday with quarantine would have realized that it may not definitely mean that they will get up but it is a good indicator, and him stretching now is also a good indicator. just got a question through from Cecilia in Maryland. Good afternoon. Cecilia is interested to know the difference in the tracks between a leopard and a cheetah and the main difference is the fact that the cheetah's claws would be present in the tracks on the ground whereas the leopard's claws would not be present. The leopard only only protracts its claws when it's latching on to prey and or climbing trees for example. Whereas the cheetahs are always out, and what has it seen, I wonder? It seems to have seen something. I'll look back and can't see anything from my angle. Maybe it didn't see anything. So that's one of the major differences that you'll look at in the tracks. Their tracks are also quite slender. Their back pad also has three lobes, just like a lion and a leopard would. But they are very angular and What I can do is have a look in my book and, and see, no, the track in the book is no good. Copy, good plan.
So sadly, the the tra the photo or the drawing of the cheetah tracks in my book are nothing like the actual real thing. So I can't show you a re resemblance in the book or a comparison in my book. But the cheetah's back pad is far more angular, and I like to describe it as shaped like a stealth bomber. That back pad, so considerably different to the track of lion and leopard, the cheetah's tracks with the main difference being the claw, Cecilia. Sorry, if you could just send that through one more time. Kim in Chicago, good afternoon and welcome. Kim is interested to know whether if cheetah came across cubs of lion, leopard, or hyena, would they also kill those cubs? And I think the answer to that is yes. I actually haven't seen footage of that, come to think of it, and I'm not 100% certain of that happening. But I think there is a very strong chance that that would happen, and competition between all the predators is high, and I'm fairly confident that that would happen. Mark, what do you think about that question? I think I'm kind of the same as you. I've never seen it happen. Yeah. But I think that it, I think that if if a cheetah was, especially a male, I guess if he came across a leopard cub or something, I don't know if you can hear me. I hope you can hear me. I think but, so. Uh, I think so too. Cool. Well, then we're on the same page there. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, with opportunism, and if you can if if you can eliminate your competition, they do. Exactly. I don't think they'd seek them out the way that maybe hyena would seek out cubs or a or, or lion would seek out the cubs of, of comp competitors. Oh, he's up. Nikki, I just need to shoot off for a quick comfort break, so if we could cut back to Mark for a few minutes, that would be great. Right, we are really gifted this afternoon, and it happens to be a Saturday too. Weekend. So I'm hoping that there are going to be some of you who manage to watch on the weekends that sadly don't join us during the week. I would hate to have this happen on a Wednesday or a Thursday and then you find out about it on a Saturday. So I'm really, really glad that this cheetah has chosen today of all days. Really beautiful sighting. And just one of those wonderful moments when patience has really paid off, sitting with him and being careful of his space. Now he's so relaxed with us. Question from Fabienne from Canada. Traditionally, how many cubs in a litter and how long 
would they stay with mom? I'd say on average three, uh, three, four. They have, I've known Cheetah to have five, I've known Cheetah to have six cubs. Um, obviously the, the, the more cubs, the higher the, the attrition rate, the higher the, 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 the or, or rather the lowest the survival rate because they do lose cubs. Um, but I have on numerous occasions seen a cheetah successfully raise three to maturity and, and whether they started off as three or not is a min another story entirely or another matter. But the, the, the learning process that I was talking about earlier, this whole process of, of learning how to hunt and learning how to kill, learning how to not only open the carcass but also learning which part of the carcass they need to eat and how to eat it and, uh, and especially because well when we look at a cheetah's face you can see how they're not really built for chewing bone and chewing heavy material so they don't have those masseter muscles those cheek muscles that leopard and lion have and they tend to mostly only go for the meat which makes a carcass that a cheetah is eaten very easily noticeable because it's mostly the meat that's eaten off the bone and very little bone that has been chewed. They do chew on the edges of vertebra and ribs and things. But a cheetah, as soon as they learn how to do these things, as soon as they learn what it is they need to do as fast as they need to do it to survive, they can become independent. And for some cheetah that can happen at 18 months, if need be, but generally it's probably from about two to two and a half years. been a long time since I've sat with the cheetah lying in the grass. I used to sit with them at night, I mentioned earlier, in the full moon. Myself and our caterer full at the time. She was an Irish lass. Very thick Irish accent. Teresa wants to know if there's any prey in the area. I'm not seeing anything yet. I know that there, there, there are a lot of Nyala around the lodge. We're right next to the lodge. I have to tell you, we are only a stone's throw from the owner of Juma, Yuri, Yuri and Pippa Moorman. We're only a stone's throw from their house. In fact, from here we can see the mast that we broadcast from is right next to us. Uh, that's where all the, the equipment is that brings you these wonderful images from Africa live in real time. And just to the north of us, just to our left, is Vuyatela Lodge and the Staff Village when, where we stay. In the Staff Village. There are a lot of Nyala that live around the lodge and there are a lot of Impala that live out here too. There's a herd of Impala that live on quarantine. They spend the day in the bush out off of the open area where they browse and graze and they come out onto the open for safety because 364 days of the year it is pretty safe out here. Actually no, it's probably less because when they're lambing the hyena out here every night probably eating a few of the lambs and every now and then leopard and lion come through but I promise you they are not expecting this little pussycat. Sometimes on full moon nights I've sat close enough to them uh, where we've, we've, we've sat on the grass next to the vehicle so we eye level with them in the full moon moonlight and we've heard them purring and they're just as relaxed as ever. See, his eyes are closed, his tail is relaxed.
Stop it, thanks. The other thing is that as it gets dark, which it is going to do, we're going to have to leave him because his safety depends on his anonymity. Anonymity. His stealth in arriving here. And if we were to put a light on him, well, we could put him in danger. So. The one thing that we do not do, we don't use lights with cheetah at night, they are diurnal predators. And he's out here not to hunt, he's a, well, unless something came now. <coughs> unless there was a, an opportunity that surfaced. Interestingly, there is a little bit of a termite mound just off to the side here. I'm guessing he might even go and lie there at some point. Nice view of Scott and, and Jay on the other side of him. Wild Earth viewing cheetah. We could swap cameras. <laughs> we could swap cameras and we could... T okay, your turn to take a photograph of me of cheetah. <laughs> um... We're just showing you what the two vehicles look like from a distance. This, we don't ever get to show you a vehicle in a sighting and this is how it gives you an idea of sort of distance and and well this is what we appear is Jigger, Jigger and Scott and Jason and then we'll just switch so that you can see us from their perspective. I don't think it gets much better than this. We've got both angles perfectly covered here. And if anything were to approach, we would certainly be able to tell because we've got a 360 degree view now covered by the Wild Earth team. And this is such a special moment and really, really wonderful that we can both be sharing it here with all of you. And I have no doubt that a lot of you are taking screenshots of this and we are always so grateful for all the screenshots that you do capture of us and all of the animals. And this is a great opportunity for us to express our gratitude for those screenshots because without you snapping away, we wouldn't have any of this footage to look at when we grow old. So thank you so much for the screenshots that you do take. Mark's shooting from the hip there, as you can see. The tried and tested photographic technique. got a question through from Bob in Iowa. Good evening Bob and welcome along. Bob is interested to know whether cheetah are as successful a hunter as wild dogs are. Now for those of you who don't know, wild dogs have an exceptionally high strike rate when hunting and obviously it does depend greatly on the individual pack and even a certain pack will go through times when they are hunting efficiently together and at some stages less efficiently just like a sports team I guess you could relate it to and it's no different for cheetah even though 
they may not be hunting in a team, unless there's a, a coalition of males, of course, but typically they're solitary. And some may be more successful than others, but I don't think they will be as successful in general as wild dogs when it comes to hunting. But good question, and it would be interesting to know, know of some research done on individual cheetah comparing their success rates amongst the same species as well as comparing them to wild dog but sadly I don't have any of those facts stored in my head but I'm sure they will be somewhere and it is worth looking into good question Bob Just got a question through from Jane in Colorado. Good evening and welcome. Jane is interested to know whether male cheetahs will kill cubs that they have not sired. Just like lions and leopards would do. Now for those of you who don't know, it is harsh, but it is normal behavior for both lion and leopard males to kill cubs that they have not sired. And the same applies for cheetah. So if they did not fire the cubs and come across a female who still has the responsibility of raising those cubs, they will kill them. And what that does is it allows them to then get their genes into the system. Got a question through from Carolyn asking if there's any purpose for the white tip at the end of the tail. And yes and no. For a male who has no requirements to help in raising his cubs that he sires, he would therefore not typically have any young animals requiring to follow him. Whereas the female cheetah will have cubs that will need to follow her and that big white ball of fluff at the end of the tail would be a good lure to keep her cubs focused on her when she's moving through the bush and that way keep following her. So definitely a, a follow me signal but only probably relevant for the females and not the males. And I think it's just a matter of moments now before this cheetah gets up and starts moving. And isn't that going to be wonderful to see him pacing through this open plain? The grooming and yawning and stretching is a very good indicator. of the cheetah and it does have some of those paws displayed so we will be able to creep uh, a little bit closer but now it's turned back over again so maybe Mark will be able to get closer as he is busy repositioning and 
think he does have that plan. So we're going to cut back to Mark Nyers. He is in a better position than us. So enjoy the angles. And I'm hoping that they are a little bit closer than us and you will be able to get a good angle. Well, someone's asked to get a little bit of a closer angle on the paws and unfortunately he rolled over when Scott and Jason were trying to get that. He's now lying in a really great position for us to see his, at least his hind paws. You can see those three lobes at the back, which are characteristic of all the cat tracks. But also how the middle lobe of the three is sort of indented, it's set in, which the leopard and the lion aren't. But most noticeably, and I don't know if you can pick that up, but um, that are his claws. And... Not so much in the task marks. Copy. I'm wondering what tusk marks there were on the cheetah. <laughs> the cheetah, and I'm thinking, what tusk marks on the cheetah? <laughs> okay, I'm being silly. But yes, I guess you could see. Oh, but there's another, there's an added thing. That's from the Juma Land Cruiser from this morning. We got charged by a Juma Land Cruiser in the Leopard sighting put Jason on a vehicle and something's going to bump into it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being frivolous. We had a cheetah sighting. Be serious. But yes, I guess it's, you don't often get to see us in our vehicles, in our offices. Our toys. but super wonderful toys they are to be able to bring this to you live from the African bush felt. I don't think there's anywhere else in the world that can do it the way we do it. A wild cheetah that's made an appearance here at Juma Game Reserve on an open area we call Quarantine. We dream of it every day to see cheetah here because it's one of the only open areas we really have access to, or the large open areas that we have access to. He's a cheetah that will roam quite a vast area and no doubt there are other big open areas that he utilizes or hunts in. I'm not mistaken, he's still got a little bit of pink fur around his face, probably from eating quickly. He's getting a bit of blood on his fur. From his position, if anything, because of the, the, the lie of the land, the topography, if anything was to come out onto the open area or approach him in any way, he's lying fairly low down, he will see their heads appearing above the horizon against the, the sky. One of the advantages of being very, very flat like a cheetah and being in open grassland like this is to be able to see things from a distance, to be able to have forewarning or foreknowledge if it's for, 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 for hunting.
Lynn in Michigan's asking how can he be relaxed or so relaxed with vehicles if he doesn't come here so often. Well, Lynn, he, we, we don't know what frequency he comes through Juma, um, but in all the other areas that he does probably travel, he encounters vehicles, all the other game lodges. I'm pretty sure that the other lodges around here have seen him before and seen him on numerous occasions that have resulted in him becoming quite accustomed to vehicles and being relaxed with the vehicles. There's a difference in the way a cheetah behaves when he's on a kill, when he's, when he's feeding, because it's that, that moment, from the moment that he kills something till the moment that he's or she, for that matter, the moment that they're, they've either had enough of the carcass or they're being chased off, but for that entire time, that from start of feeding to, the, to whatever the outcome is, they are super vigilant. Most animals make a noise when they are killed. Most animals give a death cry. Cheetah try their best to stifle it doesn't always happen. Um, being either a, a hunter that strangles their prey or they bring it down at, at such high speed that they're able to, uh, the, the neck is broken so there is no noise but nonetheless there's a little squirrel right in front of me actually making its way towards the cheetah. It's looking, it's running in the grasses and lifting its head up going to see and he's just noticed that he's just seen the squirrel now coming towards him he's sitting up and watching it Scott squirrel <laughs> yeah, he's twisting around watching the squirrel I don't think <laughs> That was a very brave squirrel. <laughs> I don't think that squirrel's ever seen a cheetah. Sorry, you can get dis distracted. Sorry about that distraction. Where was I? What was I saying? I watched that squirrel come to the marula tree and I thought oh, I was going to climb the tree and start alarming. But it did even a braver thing actually ran towards the cheetah. He couldn't believe it. He was flabbergasted. So cheetahs actually travel over quite large areas and other guides get to see them and they get to learn how to calm down. I was saying that also they get very nervous around the kill because other things are likely to come and steal it from them. They don't have strength. I mean, look at those legs. Skinny legs. Small jaws. Thin waist. They're kind of scrawny cats in a way. So they don't really have much of a chance in a fight and that's why they don't really stick around for a fight. And, and they'd rather have an advanced warning of something coming in when they're feeding and get away quickly which is I think what he did this morning there was a leopard the fact is that there was a leopard around anyways weird why that leopard didn't come out after he killed something but evidently the leopard did have an encounter with him now if I remember correctly in 2011 I think it was in Duna off of Zoe's Road could have been Mishu Maybe it was Mishu, one of Karula's cubs, at about the age of two or so, had an encounter with a cheetah just off of Zoe's Road in that open area where we sometimes watch the sunrise. And there's now a new little track that cuts through that piece of bush towards quarantine. There was an encounter between the leopard and cheetah, and I'm wondering if it's not maybe even the same cheetah. That also could be. Oh, Ellen.
see, yeah, I can see the scar now that I'm looking through the binoculars. Ellen in Arkansas saying that there's a scar, the lower left of his nose, sort of a diagonal scar going down the front of his nose. And yes, Ellen very much so, that will probably be there forever. Or the hair might grow, but there will always be a little bit of a scar there, and that will be something that you'll be able to see as a key identifying feature. Well, you don't even have to worry about spot patterns and things. Once again, there was a little bit of a strong breeze that blew through here, stronger than this prevailing wind that we've had all afternoon. And that little gust of wind made him sit up and look about. Sound-wise, there's a sound of fork-tailed drongos and starlings and babblers. That lovely evening sound of the birds trying to get the last word in before they all go to sleep. Really a lot of chat about names. I guess since the lion and the leopard are named, I don't blame a lot of people for asking if there's a name or if there's a way to name him. His name is Cheetah, for now. Um, I think it's up to, it's entirely up to the guides of the Sabi Sand whether they name individual Cheetah or not. Um, it causes way too much confusion when we put names to things and we are only temporarily here. Um, it's the residence of the Sabi Sand. Marissa in Texas. Hello, Texas. How are you, Marissa? The survival rate of cheetah young, as opposed to other cats. Marissa, I'm afraid I have to, once again, and this depends. I think there are different areas where cheetah success rate is higher. I can't give you a, a general answer because what works in one area might not work in another and some of the influencing factors on the survival rate of cheetah are most obviously lion, leopard and hyena populations within uh, the same area that interspecific competition that exists as well as whether the habitat is, is sufficient, whether there, there is good enough habitat for the cheetah. Um, I would say that the habitat type, the vegetation that occurs in an area very much dictates the number of prey species that are in an area and that always will indicate or that will always have an influence on the population of the predators that occur there and even then predator populations vary accordingly or according to different criteria. You see you can't take every area in Africa and say that for every 10 square miles you've got one pride of lion and you've got 10 leopards and you've got three cheetah. It doesn't really work that way. Um, things vary, and even within an area, I mean, we can go through times here in the Sabi Sand where there is an era of, of relative ease of pressure on cheetah that they're able to have higher success rates at raising their cubs, 
and then there can be times when maybe because of lion pressure and hyena pressure things change and that might be at a time when cheetah populations are in a particular area I'm not saying in general but in a particular area like the Sabi sand there can be times when maybe cheetah populations have reached a point kind of like leopard populations up here right now almost like saturation there's nowhere for these leopards to go when they're getting mature and so there's probably a higher mortality rate because of it um, there's just so many factors that it's very hard to give you a singular answer to that kind of question Let's go over to different angle again. Slightly more to the front of him than we are. Uh, we'll go over to Scott. Welcome back to myself and Romeo's vehicle. And I'm not sure what the angle was like for Mark's vehicle, but you can see his left paw. And on that left paw, you'll notice that the back of the pad at the opposite end to the toes is very pronounced and angular, more so than lion and leopard. So that's sadly, well it is the best angle we've got at the moment. Now what has he seen? Nothing that I can see at this stage, but something got his attention down there. Now, you may have heard Mark's vehicle start up, and he is heading off, and the reason why he is heading off is, unlike Lion and Leopard, we do not view Cheetah after dark with the spotlights, so Mark's decided to head off and start looking for some other interesting animals for us to view, which is a great idea, because we probably have about another 10 to 15 minutes worth of light that we'll be able to stay with him maybe a little bit longer and we will stay with him for as long as we can until it does get too dark to film without the use of spotlights and the reason being is cheetah are diurnal cats their nighttime vision net isn't nearly as good as that of lion and leopard and just like we avoid shining on other daytime animals, mainly herbivores, but also wild dog, for example. We will practice the same procedure with cheetah. Well, I hope he doesn't move a muscle and decides to sleep here this evening. I've just got a question through from Kathy in Florida. Good evening, Kathy, and welcome on board. Kathy is interested to know the lifespan of cheetah, and it's a good question. Around the 10-year mark is a figure that I've heard, so there and thereabouts. I would have personally thought a few years older than that, but 
10 years is a figure that is quoted in various different textbooks. So Sadly not next, this is as good as the camera can perform in this light. Did I just say goodest? You may have. <laughs> By goodest I meant best. This is the, be the best the <laughs> camera can perform in low light. <laughs> Another question has just come through from Deb in Ohio. Good evening and welcome. Deb is interested to know if there's any female cheetah patrolling the Sabi Sands, and I'm sure there are in the different parts of the Sabi Sands. We traverse currently about 3,000 hectares of 65,000. So that gives you an idea of the tiny patch of the Saabi sands that we are entitled to explore. So it's a lot bigger than the area that we can traverse and there certainly will be some females moving around. But in all my time in the Saabi sands, cheetah numbers have been very low and there's probably not too many ladies for this guy. I don't know of any specific details though, sadly, but I'm certain there'll be some floating around. As I was saying, it looks like he may spend the evening here, and it's a great place for him to spend the evening. Just like prey animals will seek refuge in open clearings, animals like cheetah will do the same thing because it's going to be very difficult for anything to creep up on this cheetah in this very open clearing. Contrary to if it was in thick bush, especially in this windy weather, animals would be able to creep up a lot easier to it Now, if he does spend the night here, I'm sure he'll be awake far earlier in the morning than we are, sadly. And it, he'll probably start moving when it is still dark. But Mark and myself will certainly aim to try and find his tracks and do our best to track him down as soon as we can. You may be able to hear Jason letting off a few giggles. He's easy to humor, and that's him giggling in the background. I've just got a question through from Robin asking, how do I know that cheetah's night vision isn't as good as lion and leopard? And that's simply from what I've been told. I've sadly never had the opportunity to actually Okay, well, Mark's just found something very interesting, folks. So I'm not going to carry on with that question, and we're going to cut across to Mark 
and find out what he's found. And it'll probably be goodbye from the cheetah this evening, so this is going to be the last views we have of it. And we'll do our best to find him in the morning. All I can see is a little bit of... Folks, what I have is a young Janet cat. And it's just in there. Let's see if it might be moving around. It's a little bit... It's a youngster, so it's playing around in a tree. Probably mom has... You see a little bit of a, a ring tail, almost like a few of the spots almost like a raccoon's tail ring tail like a okay, maybe from this angle there so, no yeah. Well, it was pretty much ignoring us and climbing in and out of that tree. Small spotted genet. G-E-N-E-T. And although it is called a genet cat, it is not really a cat. It does look very much like a cat. It's very similar, but very similar paws to a cat although it's got claws like a cheetah but it is actually mongoose family it's closer to the mongoose but then mongoose are also closer to cats than they are dogs so it gets complicated but well it was a janet very special little janet we are now at the spot pretty much where I left Mbula this morning and he hasn't been found this evening there were a couple of people that were trying to find his tracks but nobody could find his tracks, so it's very possible that he hasn't or hadn't come out of this very thick area of bush shot. Maybe now the darkness is going to start, or maybe he has started moving already. It'd be nice to see if we can maybe find his tracks coming out. He might have headed further south again towards Treehouse De or Twin Dams. I'm hoping, maybe, just like this morning, he might be lying in the road somewhere. Bunny. A scrub hair. Chelapan. Actually, it'd be interesting to see if there's any water left here at Chelapan. Haven't been down here for a little while. Here's a young scrub hair. They only come out for Easter and Pesach. Today, many, many years ago in the mid 70s, today, a very particular day in the Jewish calendar, known as Shabbat Hagadol. And yeah, no, I shouldn't be driving holding a light on Shabbat. But Shabbat Hagadol was my bar mitzvah piece. Any of you know what that means? It was about a few decades ago. Just a few decades. And Shabbat Agadol is the Sabbath before Passover.
next thing we have to see is a honey badger, the only thing we have on the list to, to, we haven't seen on the list. I bet you that's from Alan. And porcupine, Susie saying porcupine. Porcupine pie, porcupine pie. Vanilla soup. Tutti fruity. So I still have a serval on my list. And a serval, yeah. Liam saying serval on the list. I will add hard fork. And not an hard fork <coughs> in a tree. We've seen one of those already. We don't want to see another one of those. So, I don't see any sign of our monster leopard coming this way. So, let's go up towards Weaver's Nest. Does that take double A or triple A? Triple A. Debbie, hello Debbie. Debbie is in Lakewood. Mm. I have to try and guess where would Lakewood be? Could it be Florida? Debbie's asking if quarantine mail and oh, New Jersey. Lakewood. Eh? Okay. Surely. Anyways, if quarantine mail and Konyuma were to come up, would they hide from Mvula? I don't think so, not at the moment. I don't know, actually. I don't think they know. I don't think anybody would really be able to predict what would go down. Based on recent events, based on past experiences with leopards here, and I have to admit, whether it's the same leopards or different leopards, they are just that, they are past events. You can't really come to any conclusion or you can't make any assumptions about what a cat is going to do in a, given, in a given circumstance because it's not going to necessarily be the same way that it behaved the last time you saw it in similar circumstances and circumstances can never be the same. So they never behave the same way. Behavior, once again, all over... Again, there's this, this wonderful unknown that is animal behavior and it's one of the things that keeps us watching, one of the things that drives us, one of the things that makes life out here so phenomenal in that we want to be here when that happens so that we can see what can happen. Uh, it's a possibility that I know I'm cheating sorry but I thought I saw something behind that lid with me maybe not active they might be able to be in the same place I mean I can remember there was a time with Yambilu Yodan and Induna being in the same Tambuti tree with a Nyala kill and there wasn't even any hissing going on but at the same time there was a time when Mishu had an impala in a marula tree and Nduna was in another marula tree 50 feet away and the two of them were, 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 were shooting daggers at each other. They were spitting, hissing, fire and fury. But I suppose that was that particular day. That's behavior. It's, uh, it's how hungry they are, it's how stressed they are, it's how threatened they are. There are so many things that, that influence behavior that make it so unpredictable. Baby chameleon, oh, it's tiny. Get a little closer. I think it is. It looks 
like it could be. Yes, it is. Gorgeous little thing. Very small chameleons, only about two inches long. That's a baby. way he could have gotten by without us seeing any tracks was if he crossed the road perpendicularly and he didn't walk along a road at all but so far so much sign of him coming out of that area where he was could also be because it's a fairly thick area and there's a very deep drainage line that runs from Philemon's dip down towards Twin Dams Road We've seen Matimbas eating a buffalo down there, very deep drainage line. A good possibility that he might have found himself something down there. And if we don't find anything tomorrow morning, it might be time to go in on foot and try and walk the drainage line and see if we can find him. But certainly not looking like he's coming out of there. <coughs> or he has come out. Somebody wants to know how on earth I spotted that chameleon. Well, my mother will tell you that I've been obsessed with chameleons most of my life, since a very, very young age. And I can spot a chameleon at 60 feet at 10 o'clock at night. There he is. He is our cat. No, oh, it's not a cat, it's a bush buck. <laughs> I just saw two big bright eyes shining back at me. And I thought, oh, maybe he's there. But, and being a bush buck, lying there, could be a daker even. Hard to tell, but it's definitely an antelope. I'm not going to disturb it with the light. It's lying down under a bush. I thought it was a cat lying down. Oh, my heart leaped. Left past tense. How do you find chameleons? Well, I'll let you in on a little secret. And sometimes you don't even need lights to find a chameleon. You see, chameleons go to sleep at night and in warm nights like this, they actually sit quite far out on the branches of a tree, as we've noticed when we do see them. And while we probably do miss a number, a lot of chameleons, every now and then you have the angle of a chameleon facing, this, the side on a side of a chameleon facing you. And they curl their tail up as you've seen and they become very, very pale green. So much so that it becomes quite reflective in the light and, it's, and, and, and they kind of stand out like a sore thumb in a way. They stand out like a sleeping chameleon. I think it's time to 
to the Skorokoro grass cut road. This is where Mbula went. No, I am. I'm good. I can find chameleon and pat myself on the back. But I do have the advantage of knowing what to look for, of uh, being able to see that little shape that is different to the shape of the leaves in the tree and that paler green that isn't the same as the green of the tree. in Wales. Hello Joe. Nice to hear from Wales. Didn't Wales trash us at rugby or something? Some time ago? I don't know, I don't watch sport. I know. Anyways, Joe was asking if he could dig into my memory banks and have a have I ever had any encounter or threatening encounters with cats? I guess you could say so. Tight moments. I can remember one day with a, with a couple, this was in the Sulu Game Reserve up in Tanzania, and there was one day that I went out pretty early and there were, as early as it was, there were vultures flying in quite rapidly and it seemed to be dropping out of the sky at quite a heavy rate, quite a fast rate and, and most of them were dropping onto the ground and I was convinced that well since they're dropping onto the ground it's not likely that the predators are still there that maybe they they're on the carcass already and the predators have gone and it was amongst a lot of acacia felt it was mostly acacia so the ground was littered with twigs and of course every twig has numerous thorns you know the big white acacia thorns and ah, there I was tiptoeing through this acacia thorn hoping not to disturb the vultures trying to get closer and closer to the carcass and it wasn't the what oh, I thought you were and I had to walk slowly because it's not the kind of ground that you can walk fast because the, the, the thorns would pierce my feet of course being barefoot and all and the next minute I heard this growl and it was one of the male lions that was on the carcass he had seen me and he had he'd been lying down and the growl was more of a, a grunt than a growl it was more a sort of a grunt because he was on his side and he must have heard me and got the fright where he flipped onto his bed, onto his haunches as it were and it was more a grunt, the effort of having to do so. And all I could do was stand my ground, make myself as narrow as possible behind the little acacia, and slowly backtrack to the vehicle. And then I got into the vehicle and went up to them. And we sat and watched them ignore the vultures eating their kill. But I guess they could afford that because when they were hungry, they just went and ate another buffalo. There was a time in the Okavango Delta, it was an amazing experience. Um, we didn't have any guests in camp, but there was a guy in camp that was re-thatching some of the buildings. His name was Dave, and we called him Dave Thatcher, because he was doing the thatching. And this particular day, he was waiting for materials, I think it was a weekend or something, you know, we don't really have weekends because every day is the same, but anyway, we took some time off, I didn't have guests, we hopped into a boat, and he wanted to do some fishing, I wanted to do some bird watching, so it suited us both, sitting quietly in a lagoon or on the water, uh, him fishing, me, and uh, we passed an island on our way back. Uh, after he hadn't seen, hadn't caught any fish and I'd seen a few birds. On the way back to camp we passed an island, the monkeys were going crazy and we stopped 
I held on to the reeds because we were in a fast moving channel of the papyrus and I found an entrance to the island where elephants and hippos moved out of the water into the island and could see the monkeys going crazy about something I knew it was probably a leopard they had decided to use that opportunity to try and do some more fishing he didn't want to come onto the island so I went onto the island and I was now these islands in the Okavango are not your usual islands a lot of them are very sandy with very sharp grasses very hard grasses but on the edge of the islands you have papyrus and reeds and marshland and then you have a beautiful tree line of sausage trees and mangosteen and just really beautiful trees very dense wooded area and then on the interior of the islands you have these beautiful beautiful grassland in the center of these yep, these islands and there was some lechway on the island and they were looking towards me and I'd heard these two leopards, well, I'd heard leopard and I knew they were mating so when I got off of the boat sorry I'm getting a story mixed but anyways got off of the boat creeping through this tree line and I could see the lechway weren't disturbed so I knew the leopard weren't on the interior of the island and I turned around to head towards the boat and there was this leopard, he was coming over a, a fallen log and he was only a few feet behind me, this big male leopard and he froze in, in mid-stride as I turned around and faced him and I, I said to him, I was speaking to him, I said I'm sorry to disturb you Mr. Leopard, didn't really mean it and he froze and I froze and I even called out to Dave to bring the pole because you always carry a pole in a boat in case your motor dies so that you can push the boat with the pole to help me to just try and distract this leopard but he eventually turned off turned around and slunk off but I was it was a, a very tense moment standing there with just my binoculars on my hip no shirt no shoes my hat on my head and nothing else and uh, well, sticky moment. There have been others. I'll get to them maybe on other drives for the time being. Sounds like Scott has got something interesting to show you. So I'm going to go over to Scott. I don't know if we'll find a mula tonight. Just let me know my earpiece fell out. You are definitely live as we speak. Welcome back. And apologies, my earpiece just fell out there. But isn't this something else? And it sounds like Mark's also been doing a great job finding some of the smaller critters that are easier to find at night. And this is one of them. This is a nocturnal spider called the bark spider. And as we can see, it's busy spinning its web. And every evening they will build their web and every morning they will consume all of the webbing so as to not waste any of it. Take the web down and then rebuild it every evening. So certainly not a lazy spider and as Jason zooms out you will notice that it's still got a little bit of work to do this evening and I'll try and illuminate the other parts of the web but you can see it's just started going around on the periphery and those peripheral webbings will then come closer and tighter as it moves closer to the circle or to the center rather but right now it looks like it's taking a bit of a breather now we may aid in the spider's hunting plans for this evening because by having this spotlight shining on it, there's one or two moths that are fluttering about. Now you might be wondering, how on earth would it start building the web? And what they do is, from wherever they perch, they will slowly let off 
a piece of webbing that will get blown by the wind and eventually anchor it onto another piece of vegetation downwind. The spider will then walk down that anchor line and let off more anchor lines and that way set up a few anchors from which it can start building the nest. So the initial anchors will essentially be the foundations and then it can continue to fine tune what will eventually become an incredible masterpiece. You can see that piece across there's the anchor. Try and show. Um, it's difficult. There's a good one there. Because you can actually see the grass getting pulled towards the web. There we go. Well done, Jason. So there's one anchor, and you can see how the grass has been pulled to the one side and then continues up. to the main section of the web and great work there on the camera Romeo thank you well we'll leave the spider to it because I fear that our presence being here has caused it to stop doing its business and we wouldn't want to interfere too much so Let's leave this wonderful little arachnid and continue on and see what else we can find. Just to keep you updated, the cheetah was left, well we left him, as it got basically pitch black, we left him lying in exactly the same position. So some great prospects for tomorrow morning and I'm already looking forward to waking up bright and early and doing our best to track down this cheetah. <coughs> Excuse me. It will be difficult though and I will say that in advance because they will often get active just as it's beginning to get light, light or even when it's slightly dark and it will therefore have a head start on us. Even at the moment when we are getting mobile, the first 10 to 15 minutes of the drive, it's very difficult for us to see any sign of tracks on the road because it's not light enough yet. So the fact that even the first 15 minutes of us driving around, we'll really battle to establish which direction he's moved in. I really am loving the fact that we are spending more time driving around after dark and that's simply because of the change of season. Uh, a few months ago we would maybe use the spotlight for five or ten minutes towards the end of the drive and there are so many interesting nocturnal animals that yes they are difficult to find and sightings of them may be brief but they are still out here and still wonderful to be able to try and show you. And an example of that is the small spotted genet that Mark managed to find for you this evening. So that's one of many of the interesting nocturnal animals that we get out here. ladies that are interested to know what size that bark spider was and that was Kathleen and Christine good evening and welcome it was about if I use my hand as a example or even my watch face would maybe be better it would pro it was probably as round as the face of my watch so that gives you an idea of its size um, and it also gives you the time it's quarter to seven South African time. So, yeah, probably, what's another 
about half the size of a golf ball would be its total size I would say if you cut a golf ball in half that would be the size of that bark spider and it was a big one they're not always that big that was a trophy specimen thankfully they are of no danger to us humans so they pack a small punch with regards to their venom and we can even handle them without worrying about being bitten I have a question we've got a question from Romeo on the back of Jigger go ahead with your question Romeo so I've noticed that you're using a spotlight which I find very helpful yes now when you find an animal you often see that their eyes shine in the spotlight and I often see two different colors is there reason for the different colors is there something different with antelope or unknown there, there are different speculations and that's a good question Romeo and some people say that you can tell that carnivores eyes glow red whereas herbivores eyes glow yellow and I personally haven't noticed that maybe that's just me but I haven't noticed huge differences in any specific animal's eyes showing color. I think a lot depends on the spotlight you're using and also the angle at which you are shining the light in the animal's eyes. Oh wow, look at this. That is huge. Incredible. Now well, what we have here is a monster of a stick insect and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try my best to position the spotlight. I'll do it. Okay, Jason can do that. One second while we just get ready. And then I'm going to go and stand next to it to give you an idea. It's a monster. It is huge. You done, Romeo? Uh, what toothpaste do you use? <laughs> Your teeth are so white. It's obviously an evening for large insects and arachnids, the bark spider being the first one. Apologies. And it's slowly going about its business, crossing the road. On Buffalo cut line. Okay. Well, again, it seems like it's stopped its business because of our presence. And we will therefore carry on and see what else of interest is out there this evening. What an incredible specimen that is though. So back to Jason's questions. I haven't actually noticed any major differences in eye color between different animals. But different people may have different opinions on that matter. been a few funny remarks coming through on Twitter that Nikki's just relayed to me and the gist of it is that, that that should not be called a stick insect it should rather be called a log insect and I couldn't agree more that was an absolute monster oh, what else K 
can we find out here this evening? The porcupine would be one animal that I really would love to show you. They are such interesting looking animals. And so far it's only been porcupine quills that we've been able to show you and for... Oh, oh, bush baby. Okay. Now, this is going to be tricky, but there's a bush baby up ahead of us here. I think I might even stop here, rather than trying to get too close. And Jason's doing a great job on camera, and there you can see they're extremely agile, so what you'll notice is that they can jump huge distances. Boink! Well, I thought our luck would run out when we left that cheetah, but evidently it hasn't. And the action continues here at Juma. We might be able to get another glimpse of it. Now, that's a small nocturnal primate, the bush baby. I do believe Mark has managed to show you one and a really great sighting with Brian. But this one sadly has disappeared, but at least we got a glimpse of it. And who knows what would be around the next corner. As I was saying though, before we bumped into the bush baby, is that some of you may remember Hayden from the work him and Peter did, the two other presenters in November and December last year. And Hayden had a lucky porcupine quill that he took around everywhere with him. And that just, talking about porcupine, links me back to those happy thoughts of having Peter and Hayden here with us. Two great guys and hopefully they'll be coming back for a special appearance at some stage in the future. Because it would be great to have them back out here with us. I heard Nikki sending through some questions to Mark earlier asking how on earth do you manage to spot chameleons out here? So what I'm hoping to do is try and spot one and from a distance be able to show you how exactly we do it because it's the easiest way to to see is when we've got a zoomed out view of, of the bush that they're sitting in. And Jason and I saw was it two or three? Two. two. Two just before we found the bark spider. But now that it's time to actually find one, we can't. But we are both searching for chameleons and whatever else of interest pops its head along the way. difference really driving down any one of these roads because as I've just said we don't know what we may bump into on any of the given roads so there's no difference in terms of risk or danger on any of the roads and also in the vehicles at night we are just as safe as we would be in the vehicles during the day. What I will emphasize though is that if we were on foot at night that would be a very different story and a very scary one at that. I can, right? 
Diker? In the road. Any of us? Yeah. Okay. Jason saw a Diker shooting off the road, but we'll leave it because we don't want to shine the spotlight on it as we don't know if a leopard's around the next corner and we would hate to have a blinded diker being forced to deal with a leopard. So walking on foot during the day I am confident in doing and yes it is more dangerous than being out of the vehicle in the vehicle certainly but it's not nearly as dangerous as, as walking around after dark. So I hope that answers your question, Carolyn. In the vehicle, we are equally as safe at night as we would be during the day. Folks, from myself and Jason, I'd like to say another big, big thank you for everyone that's been following us and all your support. And I hope you've really loved this afternoon's drive because it's been an absolute cracker. And after seeing the cheetah this morning, having not seen one for five months, I really didn't think we'd see it again this afternoon. So I'm glad you were, joined, were tuned in and hope you enjoyed it. And Nikki says there's a uh, huge amounts of great screenshots that have come through this evening. So thanks very much for those. And well done to Jason on camera. Good to be with you again, buddy. So good to be and back. And we will see you all for tomorrow's adventure. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Wendy. We... I've been doing a few loops around an area where Mvula was. We're now back down on Twin Dams Road and well, I'm hoping that tomorrow we might be lucky enough to find some tracks of his. He doesn't appear to have come out back onto any of the roads, so I don't think he's left the area where we left him or where he disappeared from us this morning. So some way off to the left of us right now. Uh, very very dense when we go through the well after Telepan we're going to go through a dip and I think somewhere in that dip and there's a good chance that he might have found something like Nyala or Daika who found himself something to eat or he might just there sleeping in central Pennsylvania. Tony wants to know if there's ever possible wild earth or anywhere else. Well, this is exactly what a night safari entails, Tony. Driving around. If, I don't know what else you mean by a night safari, but is what you experience at the lodge almost. When you stay here, and you've got safari, your afternoon safari runs into night time for a couple of hours. And you get the chance of, oh, I just found an owl. Giant eagle owl. Hope our signal is good. Bilbo.
I'm trying not I'm trying to minimize the amount of light. You can see the pink islands as it turns its head towards us. Bubo lacteus, the giant eagle owl, also known as Vero's eagle owl. And a wonderful way to end what has been an absolutely fantastic day here at Wild Earth. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for being part of this live drive, this live presentation. It's the feedback from you viewers. It's the very interaction that we have with you viewers that make it so unique and make it so wonderful to be a part of. My name is Mark and Vim is with me on camera. Thanks to Scott and Jason who've been on, on Jigger and of course thanks to Nikki in Final Control. I think he wants to fly. Bye. Love you lots.